Welcome to Current Affairs. My name is Nathan Robinson. I'm the editor-in-chief of Current Affairs magazine, and I am joined today by the wonderful Garrison Lovely. He is a freelance journalist. He is a host of the most interesting people I know podcast. He has also been a contributor to Current Affairs magazine itself, having written an anonymous expose of McKinsey a couple of years back, which is no longer anonymous because Garrison has recently published a cover story for The Nation magazine, which is also on McKinsey, in which he comes out as a McKinsey whistleblower. Garrison Lovely, delighted to have you on Current Affairs today. It's been a long time coming. It has been. You know, you and I have known each other for a while, and you've been, you know, the stuff that you've done for our magazine has been great. I was always sad that the McKinsey, you couldn't have the McKinsey thing under your name in case they came and killed you. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't yet, so we'll see. But now, now you're fearless. You've now done two extended pieces on McKinsey where you worked. Why have you now dedicated yourself to exposing the misdeeds of this particular company? Yeah, I mean, it's the first job I had out of college. I went in idealistic, hoping to have some positive impact on the world through through the work, uh, while also getting to work with smart people, do something that helps open doors, whatever. It felt like kind of the best of all worlds. And I started out working on the... Rikers uh, project at McKinsey, which is trying to reduce violence within Rikers Island jail complex in New York City. And the thing that really made me disillusioned with McKinsey and, and started a years long disillusionment with capitalism itself was working for ICE while at McKinsey and just seeing what amoral profit seeking ah, looks yes. like and what it means to just serve your clients as best you can without doing any consideration for what's actually good for the world. And this just made my blood boil. And I wanted to tell that story and expose McKinsey for what it really is. You know, some people might hear what you said, you, you entered wanting to do things that were useful or positive for the world. And a, and a cynic might hear what you say and go, and you went to McKinsey? You know, I read part of uh, Pete Buttigieg's memoir, and he says, you know, I went to McKinsey because I wanted to have a positive impact on the world. Me, you know, the cynical socialist that I am, goes, what? But one of the interesting things that you point out in your Nation article is that McKinsey actually tries to mislead people, young people, in the recruitment process. When they go to the Ivy League campuses, they actually sort of distort the nature of the work you'll be doing by giving the examples that they give you are examples of good things. <laughs> yeah, totally. It's it's one of the biggest responses I got on Twitter to the, the Nation essay was like, you're a rube. Like, how could you ever have bought this? <laughs> like, just so naive. And, and like, I admit to being naive in the piece. Sure. and. I didn't go in thinking that every McKinsey project was some inspiring effort to make the world better, but just that some of them were and that you could actually work on those projects and, and do good work within them. And I was sold on this project where they were yeah, tasked with reducing violence within Rikers Island, which seemed like a good mission to me. And I'd been working on prison reform and advocacy and teaching in a prison in college. And like this was actually just felt like a great opportunity to, to do that in practice. So they say to you, the, the Rikers Island being the, the, the large main jail facility in New York City, they say to you, well, we've got, I guess, this contract with the New York City government. There's all these problems in Rikers Island. Our job is to come in as experts and fix these problems, make this you know, infamously violent prison less violent. And that the the bureaucracy has sanctioned this, and so they give you this kind of pitch that you, as a as a young prison reformer, looks at and thinks, "Well, gosh, you know that it doesn't actually seem bad to reduce violence in Rikers Island prison." And so, explain to us how that goes wrong. Let's take the naive perspective, which is, okay, the, the city contracts with a consultant, the city has all these problems in this horrible prison, and asks the consultancy, how do we fix the problems? And the consultancy comes back with the problems. What starts when you get in to McKinsey and you're working on this Rikers project, where do you start to have some doubts about this? 
Yeah, I mean, I think while I was at Rikers for that summer, it wasn't obvious to me that it wouldn't work. And the thing that was most I was most optimistic about was these efforts to classify people incarcerated based on actual predictors of violence. And this was like seen as the way to get the, the most reductions by just like keeping people apart who would be likely to yeah get into fights or, or something. And I think there's a few things like one is McKinsey just didn't know what it was doing. They had no experience working for corrections agency of any kind. Rikers was the first project like that, to my knowledge. The other is that like Rikers itself is just felt unreformable just as an institution, just so corrupt and reliant on violence. And just the abolish Rikers campaign kind of recognizes this and sees yeah Rikers as as what it is, which is just like this horrible place that like has always been horrible and feels like it always will be horrible. And I think looking back on it with reporting that came out after I left McKinsey, McKinsey was pushed to find violence reductions through this reclassifying people incarcerated thing. And they basically took the the least violent people, put them all together in one unit and said like, oh, look, this new unit has really low violence and like we can extrapolate that to the whole island and claim victory. And this is just basically bullshit, right? And so that major piece of the project, the city scrapped and, you know, $30 million of effort on McKinsey's part has more or less just come to nothing. And, and Rikers is as bad as it ever was. And I don't know every detail of like where that went wrong. I do think that like one thing I left out of the, the nation piece is I propose this program for like progressive rewards for people or housing units based on good behavior, based on something I'd seen while teaching debate in a juvenile facility upstate. And this was actually rolled out across the entire agency. And I, I didn't find out until I came back to work at McKinsey full time. And it was just this pretty amazing thing where it's like, oh, I came in, had an idea, did some analysis, put together a presentation, and it was like going directly to the person who could actually make the decision to implement it. And I don't know the results of that program, if it actually ended up having good effects, but it was the type of thing that made me feel like, oh, wow, I actually did something good in this role. And yeah, I think there's like maybe some opportunities on, on the margins to, to do work like that. But by and large, it's just really hard. I want to talk to you about the kind of constraints on what can be posed. So my first thought is if I was tasked with reducing violence in a prison, the first thing you'd want to do is interview every prisoner. You'd want to sit each person down one by one, and you want to ask them, why do people commit violence here? Give us the explanation. And you'd want to say to every prisoner, you know, what would cause you, know, you to commit a violent act? What have you seen? What was the cause of it? What do you think could have prevented it? And you would go literally by each person. That is not what happened. <laughs> no. I mean, McKinsey interviewed probably dozens of people over the course of like years of, of work at Rikers. And to my knowledge and in, in the reporting, I haven't seen any evidence that they interviewed anybody who was incarcerated at Rikers. So yeah, that's a problem. Another problem is that McKinsey just doesn't have the degrees of freedom to do the things that would actually reduce violence meaningfully at Rikers. And so cash bail, for example, is a program where people who cannot afford to make bail stay incarcerated prior to their trial. And these are people who are not deemed flight risks or dangerous to, to others. And like the only reason they're incarcerated is because they don't have enough money. Ending cash bail while I was uh, working at Rikers for McKinsey would have reduced the number of people in Rikers by half. And so if you have way fewer people, there's just going to be less violence. And it's just fewer people spending weeks, months, or years rotting in the worst place in New York. And that is something that McKinsey could never recommend because it was out of scope. And like, of course, like McKinsey you know, isn't going to be like advocating for a big policy change. Like that's just not their remit, as they would say. But you're just never going to solve the problem if you're just limited to these like the small box of technocratic tweaks. Yeah. And so in some ways, it sounds almost as if I don't want to say the problem is not McKinsey, but in some ways, the problem is not McKinsey, because the problem is that is having a an organization that is given a certain very narrow mandate to pursue a certain set of optimizing solutions. And, you know, the kind of institution it is, is always going to, you know, if what McKinsey is, is 
a, an organization that you call in to help you optimize something or make something better. And then if that institution doesn't have very strong moral guardrails, uh, you point out in one of your pieces that there's not really much that would have prevented McKinsey from, say, helping the Third Reich more efficiently produce Cyclone B because they say we do execution, not policy. Sometimes execution is not policy, right? Tell us a little bit about what, after observing this, you think is the core problem here. Yeah, it's a really hard question because some people will say McKinsey is actually incompetent and overrated and overpriced and like they just are a waste of time and money and all of their clients are kind of suckers. Then some people say that McKinsey is actually meaningfully helping bad actors be worse, right? Like by helping ICE deport people more efficiently or helping Saudi Arabia like entrench power more effectively or whatever it might be. And then sometimes it's just like, more complicated. And yeah, even where the goals are good, like reducing violence in Rikers, it's just they're not able to actually get the job done. But then in other cases, like helping ICE support people more effectively, they, they, they are. They're good at it. <laughs> and yeah, I don't think there's just like one overarching thesis that captures everything. The thesis of the, the current affairs essay that I wrote about McKinsey is, is that it it's kind of capitalism distilled. It's global, it's mobile, it's made up of like the quote, best and brightest and it spreads ideas from company to company and government to government. And it, it kind of makes everything more the same, more profit seeking, more amoral. And it, it also tips things in, in favor of management by advocating for executive compensation increases and advocating for cuts to labor and, and never any kind of like looking at you know the pay of you know the leaders of these companies. And so however you feel about capitalism is going to reflect a lot on how you feel about McKinsey. Yeah, I don't generally care for it. I think I'm pretty pretty well on the, on the record about that. I mean, I, we can definitely identify one of the problems with McKinsey as an organization being the amorality, right? But being the lack of, as I said, guardrails to prevent you from participating in anything atrocious, regardless of efficiency or inefficiency, whether they're producing good results or not producing good results. It, it does seem that within the company, there has not been and is not a sufficient way to test whether this is a thing that morally you should, in fact, be helping someone do more efficiently. Yeah, I mean, when I was there and was at ICE and I felt like we were enabling a humanitarian disaster by helping ICE hire tons more deportation officers and helping them make their processes more streamlined, there was just no way to point to McKinsey's values to say, hey, we shouldn't be doing this work based on our own stated values because all of our values at that time, I say our, all of their values at that time were about serving clients more effectively. And I think McKinsey takes that very, very seriously. And, and they take like ethics seriously in the sense of like, yeah, they're actually just trying to do right by their clients. And that's how they've been so successful for so long. There have been some changes and some reforms and you can actually point to some things now that talk about McKinsey doing good things in the world. And they have decided to stop serving certain clients. And I think this is a welcome development, but I, I don't think it goes far enough. I don't have the same firsthand experience, but I've talked to some people who are still there or stayed longer than I was who were unhappy with work that McKinsey was doing after these uh, meager reforms were put into place. You know, lawyers have the same kind of professional ethics where they say, Look, what the client does, that's, you know, that, that's not my department. My department is to make the best possible argument on behalf of the client. And doesn't everyone uh, deserve to have an advocate? Now, I think that's a little weaselly sometimes because you're the one who has the choice as to which clients you're going to be, you're going to spend your life being the voice for, whether you're going to be the voice for people who, you know, desperately need a voice or whether you're going to be the voice for people who will pay you a lot of money so that you can uh, help them continue to, say, destroy the planet by emitting fossil fuels. But it is also a little different in, in consulting, right? Because no one has a, uh, a right to a consultant in the same way that they have a, uh, a right to a lawyer. And so I don't know quite that you can make the same argument that, well, you know, doesn't the client just need help? I mean, 
Yeah, no, it is, there's just this complete abdication of moral responsibility on the part of clients. But I do think there is more of an acknowledgement that like it's a choice to serve people. For work in like Saudi Arabia, for example, McKinsey will say like, oh, it's better that we're there. We're going to help them open up and reform and, and do, do these good things. But I cited this you know, manuscript in, in the current affairs essay about how consulting firms and professional services firms, when they serve authoritarian clients, just end up bending their values to those clients. Because like Saudi Arabia is one of the biggest clients McKinsey has ever had. It's a massive paycheck for the firm. Partners build their entire careers at McKinsey based on keeping certain clients. And if they stop serving Saudi Arabia, that would mean hundreds of people probably just losing their livelihoods, which are, you know, in the yeah. millions of dollars a year in many cases. And so like, how likely are you to say something that really challenges Mohammed bin Salman after he directs the assassination of a journalist? And McKinsey didn't pull out of a Davos in the desert Saudi Arabia conference that like many other companies, like many other very rapacious capitalist firms pulled out of after Khashoggi was assassinated. And McKinsey stuck with it. And so it's like, these are the people we're trusting to be the voices on the inside who are fighting the good fight to, to make Saudi, you know, a more progressive place. Like, I, I don't think so. Yeah, because ultimately McKinsey is not a nonprofit. It's not established to serve the public good. It is established to make money. Right. And, and if it happens to do good, you know, that's great. We'll put in the marketing materials. If it doesn't happen to do good, then we hope that the New York Times doesn't find out about it later. <laughs> you know, when I interviewed a few months back, Lena Botea, who is, she worked at Capital One and she wrote a book about credit cards, predatory credit cards. She was talking about the internal culture of Capital One, where you couldn't really, there wasn't really a way to raise the question, is what we're doing hurting people, right? Because they would have to, they would be doing all these things to try and structure credit card contracts in ways that made Capital One the most money. And they would be doing it sort of without even thinking, like it would just not enter anybody's mind to ask, is this really helping? <laughs> or is this, are we just extracting money from people who don't have money? Are we being predatory? Are we locking them into contracts that they, should they really take this contract? Is this good for them? I wonder if it was the same, were these things kind of discussed? Did people's qualms come out? Or was it another thing where it just doesn't sort of enter the room? Yeah. I mean, it's the case that most clients of McKinsey are profit maximizing actors who are devoted to shareholder value as their overriding objective. And so when you do a McKinsey project for one of those clients, you're almost certainly going to be doing something that is expected to increase shareholder value or profitability. And if you were to try and object to the work, you would probably need to point to this is actually bad for shareholder profitability in order to have any chance of succeeding. The only time I saw at McKinsey, objection to the work on ethical grounds was when I was at ICE. And most of the people on my team were liberals. A bunch of them had marched in the Women's March against Trump. And when Trump issued these two executive orders, one nearly tripling the number of deportation officers within ICE, and the other targeting essentially all undocumented immigrants for deportation, People started freaking out. And I, I say in the current affairs piece, they were up in arms, were about as up in arms as overachieving Ivy League graduates ever get. And what that resulted in was this, I don't know, 15, 18 person conference call on a Thursday morning at 8 a.m. And we were raising issues with the work and how we felt like it would be bad just for people, not for, you can point to profit, right? It's a government agency. It's, it's about a mission. And you could raise the objection. McKinsey has a value that is uh, you have an obligation to dissent. And people will write emails saying like, I'm invoking my obligation to dissent and say something critical. And like, this does happen. This did happen. And people weren't, you know, categorically fired for raising that kind of dissent in the way that like Google might have fired people for organizing um, labor movements. But the dissent just doesn't really like lead to something. Uh, you know, in the ICE case, I raised concerns that the senior partner who is managing the relationship with the Department of Homeland Security, uh, Richard Elder. He compared the work at ICE to work implementing Obamacare, where he's like, a bunch of McKinsey partners disagreed with Obamacare, but they did their <laughs> duty and they implemented it anyway. And it's just like, are you kidding me? This is a, an absurd false equivalence. 
And then I raised the objection of, well, what in McKinsey's values would have stopped us from working with the Nazis to procure more barbed wire for their concentration camps? And Elder muttered something about McKinsey being a values-based organization. But again, there was nothing in the values that said, no, we wouldn't have worked for the fucking Nazis. <laughs> I think that's a pretty important... Uh, you, need to, you need to have some criteria there, uh, almost certainly. Yeah. If you're not going to go to that room. What, what role do euphemisms play? I mean, this is one of the most infamous, infamous things about corporate culture is the construction of language that, and this is what George Orwell writes about in Politics in the English Language, the way that so many kind of atrocious things are able to be done because they are talked about in ways that massage or, or downplay the human reality that is actually beneath the language. Right. Yeah. I mean, right-sizing is probably the, the first one that comes to mind. <laughs> so this is yeah. the idea that there is a right size for any num- part of a business, the number of employees that work there to maximize profits or achieve the objective of, of the organization most efficiently. And this will be really just used to justify layoffs, right? It's like, well, we looked at your department and we determined that the right size is 1,200 people and you have 1,500 people. And so we, we need 300 scalps. And you would never say scalps, right? But maybe internally people might say something like that. But it's just, you're, you're not laying people off or you know destroying their livelihoods or something. You're just right-sizing a department. And yeah, I, I think you're definitely right that this plays a role in how people do things that have negative consequences for human beings at the end of the day. And I think there's just an enormous amount of alienation from the work that you're doing. You know, so when I was doing the, the ICE work, I was tasked with building the hiring models to figure out how to hire all these deportation officers. And what this meant in practice in my head, if this happened, was hiring 10,000 people who chose to be deportation officers for Trump's immigration enforcement agency in a time where it was very clear what Trump wants to do with immigrants. And it wasn't good. And it felt like the beginning of a process to me that ended in things that we've seen before in history. And that was horrifying. But the work I was doing was putting numbers into a spreadsheet yeah. and trying to get the formulas to work. Yeah, tell me, tell me more about what your little piece of it ends up being. Yeah, I mean, I was just doing the hiring models. I was supposed to learn how to use Excel. And we had very little direction on what it looked like to hire 10,000 new people. There was no timeline specified in the executive order. There was no accounting for attrition or not. didn't specify these things. And so we were coming up with different scenarios. It's like, okay, if we have to hire them in 18 months or in three years or in five years, here's how you make the math work and how many people you need to hire each month. And like doing these things called super one stops where you hire a bunch of people on the day that you meet them. And if they can pass this battery of tests and evaluations, And I was like, 18 months to hire 10,000 people is insane, especially when there was already huge problems at ICE with having basically the worst federal law enforcement officer working there. Uh, There's a good John Oliver uh, segment about this from a while back. And uh, so I was like, why don't we say three years, five years and seven years? And I was like, we should argue for seven years. We should not account for attrition. I was trying to come up with like ways within the... Within that very narrow framework of options. Yeah, yeah, right. I also just like wasn't very good at, at building models at this point. <laughs> and so, you know, my, my like civil disobedience was just like being <laughs> bad at my job and being slow. And yeah, I, ultimately, they didn't end up hiring any of these people because there was never the appropriations for it from Congress, which I'm very grateful for. But yeah, I was like, oh, and I was in a two person office with four people. There were no windows. We were escorted around by somebody who had the right clearance to walk the halls unattended. And you go through like a metal detector that you have to take like your laptop out. And like, it was like more intense than going to the airport. Like every day you're doing this. And one day I remember leaving, this is ICE headquarters in DC, leaving the office. And there was a a small protest out front of people protesting ICE. And I'm just thinking like, you know, three months ago or six months ago, whatever, when I was still in college, I would be one of those protesters. And like, I, if I weren't doing the shop, I would plausibly be one of those protesters. And now I'm just hoping they don't see me and don't get me on film as I sneak out the side entrance. I think Daniel Ellsberg came to see, feel the same way when he was working at the Rand Corporation on uh, Vietnam stuff and then saw the war protests. Like, I really should be on the, 
I'd rather just be outside the building rather than inside this building. <laughs> right. It is. It protests do work. <laughs> you know. They, That's interesting. Yeah. The, the protests are good because the it's nice because you see protests are useful because they they convey a message of where other people's moral standards are. <laughs> right. Which side are you on? Is the you know common refrain at a lot of these things. Yes. That's an important question to ask people. I want to ask you about the, the schools, uh, you know, the Ivy League schools that funnel people in. You managed to get the National Review to write a critique of you. Congratulations on that. Thank uh, you. One of the things they, they said was, uh, they're like, he doesn't blame the schools in, enough. And I feel like you do blame the schools. But, you know, their whole point is, of course, that this, this is what happens with the, the collapse are the virtues being te- taught in school and the replacement with diversity or whatever the line is. But maybe, I mean, you've probably thought about the role of these elite colleges in channeling people into institutions like McKinsey. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this National Review article is, is pretty funny. He just refuses to acknowledge that these universities are, are part of the problem. And I'm like... They totally are part of the problem. I just posted a response to that on Twitter <laughs> saying I'm fully ready to blame Ivy League schools for their role in funneling people to these jobs. I'm honestly curious about looking more into how this happened. And I know McKinsey did play a role in this by being one of the first elite professions to go straight for undergraduates and betting on young, smart people over more experienced people. But it's just the case that at like top universities, a huge fraction, like a plurality of the students work in consulting or finance out of school. And this wasn't always the case. And this is something that is enabled and encouraged by career services, by the culture on campus. You know, people come in as an 18 year old to some elite university. They'll have never heard of McKinsey. Maybe they'll have heard of Goldman Sachs or something. And maybe they have dreams of being, you know, a doctor or doing public interest law or doing some something exciting and good for the world. And then they're just nudged slightly over time towards thinking that the best thing you can do out of school is get a job at McKinsey because that's what the like top students in a lot of these places end up doing. And it's the hardest thing to get in a lot of cases. And the next gold star to get on your... That's right. (laughs) Yeah, I I think it's just like people are, you know, at these top schools, if they've won the game of, you know, finding the most prestigious opportunity from high school and they're looking for the next thing and you can go to like Yale Law School or, you know, Harvard Med School or you can work at McKinsey, or you can work at Google, or you can work at Goldman, and just continue climbing the prestige ladder. It doesn't really matter like what you actually want to do with yourself. You're just like, you subsumed yourself completely to, uh, you call them resume robots in the National Review article, which is actually a, a decent phrase. And yeah, these schools are absolutely complicit in all of this. You know, it's funny, we ran an article last year, year before, by... Uh... Someone who I think it had also worked in uh, consulting at one point, and he he was writing about uh, Teach for America at one point, and how Teach for America managed to play on this to construct this this notion that uh, well, at these schools, what if the next gold star was for being for going and working in a public school, right? Then if you did that, if you made it really prestigious to go and work in a public school you get all of these elite university grads who are competing to go and work at a public school. And wouldn't that be great? And so Teach for America, and in fact, they successfully did that, where for, for a period of time, doing TFA at, you know, when you graduated from Cornell or Yale was, you know, similarly prestigious to going and working at McKinsey. Then you ended up with the fact that TFA as, a, as an organization is putting all these inexperienced Ivy Leaguers down in public schools and they don't know anything about how to teach. And they also had a real diversity problem with Teach for America. They tried to fix that problem by recruiting more widely at different schools. But one of the interesting things he says in this article is then they destroyed the prestige of Teach for America, got fewer applicants from the Ivy League because they wanted the gold star. They wanted the thing that was the next thing that was elite and exclusive. And when you made Teach for America elite and exclusive, people would do it. But if it wasn't, they didn't want to do it. Now they want to go back to McKinsey. (laughs) Yeah, that's fascinating. I, I remember there was a debate motion in college about Teach for America being good or bad. And I was a freshman and I thought like, oh, it's obviously good, right? You know, for getting people to do public teaching. But one of the arguments made about why it's bad is like, you're signaling that this isn't a real job. It's just like a thing you do as a pit stop on your path to real success and like a a, a proper career. I would want to look at the numbers and see like, does this increase the number of teachers? Are they getting good results for their students? And yeah, 
that that is funny though. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about another critique that the National Review made, which, as I understand it, is you know, you've mentioned here that you see McKinsey as kind of the embodiment of capitalist profit maximizing logic, but one of the things that you know, the, the response is all from the kind of free market right is always, well, no, 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 the things you think are capitalism are just crony capitalism, where the government and <laughs> capitalism are intertwined. Real capitalism, real markets would unleash, you know, the, the different forces or whatever. But it is the case that the two main examples that you cite in your Regent Nation piece of working uh, for on the Rikers Island case and on ICE are examples of the government hiring the and you know and your extreme case uh, which is the Zyklon B thing is another example of you know what happens when McKinsey gets involved with the state and state power can be so atrocious at its worst and also the Saudi government right executing dissidents these are these are things that corporations don't have the uh, freedom to do thank God yet in our society but that uh, states. Uh, do so. So, how do you respond to this idea that actually the problem here is actually government? Right. Yeah, I think that excessive state power is a problem. I think that yeah. rapacious capitalism is a problem. I think that McKinsey has played a role in both. I don't think there's like this either or gotcha situation. And he also said something about McKinsey's become more like the government, and the government is so big. And this is just not really true. Uh, McKinsey has made the government more like itself more reliant on contractor. And they played a role in successfully arguing to the government that free enterprise and, and the industry should take as large a role as, as possible in doing government functions. And so the modern contractor state was architected in, in no small part by McKinsey, helping like NASA set up. So it was like 90% reliant on contractors. And if you look at the number of federal employees in the United States, it's quite low close to the minimum of post-war U.S. federal government, and it's a percentage of population uh, even more dramatically so. Yeah, more and more of this work is being outsourced to these consultants that are paid much, much more, who are only there for a little bit, often don't develop the genuine expertise to, to execute on these government functions well, and are ultimately not accountable to the public in nearly the same way. So yeah, I, I don't know if that totally answers the question, but I just don't think there's like a, a real either or there. Right. It also struck me reading their whole uh, the whole thing, you know, where everything is supposed to come back to how wokeness is the real problem. Wokeness and government are the two real real problems. That actually, to the extent that there is accountability in McKinsey, or or it's going to get better, it might be because you know students from these schools are getting a little more social justice minded, and actually do start thinking well, maybe it's repellent to work for the prison system or the deportation bureaucracy. That seems to me to be an example of how, to the extent that there is dissent within an organization like McKinsey, it comes from the social justice warriors. Yeah, that's right. The article, the National Review says that McKinsey's compatible with leftists are used for diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives at corporations or um, ESG, environmental, social, and governance programs. So these are like various ways to make corporations better, more representative, et cetera. I think this is just him mistaking like liberal reforms versus leftist reforms because I think, you know, there's not that representation is bad at these organizations, but we've actually talked about this on, on my podcast a while back with you. If you make Goldman Sachs's board look like a rainbow coalition of every identity group, it doesn't necessarily make it not a rapacious capitalist organization. And you're clearly not going to have representation on class grounds as well. And leftist McKinsey would be arguing in favor of labor action and worker cooperatives and increasing wages for the rank and file at the expense of executive compensation. And I don't think they're going to do that. <laughs> I think that's at odds with their, uh, their actual values. Well, let's get to... Um... To close out here, you do at the end of your piece take it. We here at Curry Friends are very, very committed to not just presenting people with the bleak facts of the world as it is, but the vision of the world as it could be. Now, you point out at the end of your nation cover story 
that McKinsey won't truly reform itself, I'm quoting you here, because it neither needs nor wants to. And as the world's largest private partnership, it can't be taken over by shareholder activists, just needs its client base and its recruiting pipeline from elite universities. So you don't expect much change to occur from within McKinsey as it has a crisis of conscience and realizes that much of what it has been doing is abhorrent. So what do you suggest could be done to at least rein in some of McKinsey's uh, worst acts? Yeah, I mean, you got to hit him where it hurts. And uh, I think getting companies to no longer hire McKinsey seems really difficult. But universities are often, yeah, funneling people straight to McKinsey and other professional services firms. And you could do activism on campuses to get these firms banned from on-campus recruiting, which would make it a little bit more burdensome for them to recruit. But it would more importantly signal to students that like, hey, maybe these places aren't actually like the best place to work. You could encourage them to require publishing dossiers on the actions of McKinsey and Goldman Sachs and whoever else that balance the glossy recruiting materials that they've put out where you're going to improve the world and change lives and invent something new. And this is, I think, actually attainable. And like Harvard kicked McKinsey off its campus for like a year a while back. And I think it was for some mundane reason, but it actually can be done. And then the other is that the government can investigate and regulate this industry. McKinsey has come under the eye of the government for its role in consulting for both the FDA and the drug companies that the FDA was regulating. McKinsey played a role in the opioid epidemic by helping Purdue Pharma turbocharge opioid sales. And it was hit with a $600 plus million legal settlement with the various states. And it's small compared to the $15 billion a year McKinsey makes in revenue. But it actually does mean it just comes out of the pockets of the partners. And it says like, hey, you may think that you're doing stuff that will make you the most money. But like, actually, if you fuck up hard enough, we will come after you. And yeah, I think there's some some efforts towards this. Uh, there was a British member of the government, I think, grilling a bunch of McKinsey folks on like, are they really a profession if they don't have standards that can be adhered to? And if they don't have transparency in the way that other professions have and you can't get kicked out of it. And so I'd like to see something more like uh, other professions where you can actually you know, regulate what they do. And ultimately, I think you just want to see a de-McKinsey-fication of the world. As ambitious and much of a pipe dream that might be, McKinsey still is a source of... It benefits you to have on your resume, even in spite of all the controversy. And it's yes. helped me launch my career. My first article was with you about McKinsey. And this cover story has been very good for me as well. Yeah. And it's kind of like the gift that keeps on giving even as you say, this gift is actually bad. <laughs> yes. Well, let me ask you, then, then that actually sets me up very well for the last thing I wanted to ask you, which was, let us say you found yourself in a room with the 20-year-old Garrison Lovely, contemplating yeah. his future career, and he said to you, Garrison Lovely of the future, I'm thinking of going to work at McKinsey. I think I could do some really good work there. And also, they pay you a ton of money and people respect you and think you're smart. If some young person thinks, and you know, and I'm aware there are some problems, but isn't it better to have reformers on the inside working to make things better than people who are not reform-minded? Mm. What would you say to a young person, because obviously you can't speak to your past self, but what you can do is speak to any young people who might think along these lines, because I think it's very tempting to think along these lines. What do you say to them about whether they should, in fact, go and work and try and improve McKinsey from within? Yeah, geez. Oh, it's it's such a tough question. I mean, I think that if you go in expecting to meaningfully improve the world through your work at McKinsey, you are probably going to be disappointed. I think that cynicism has to be won through experience. It's really rare that you can convince somebody who wants something that actually no, this won't be good for you. And I think there's a lot of value in just like being <laughs> kind of brutalized firsthand by uh, going in with, with high expectations and just like getting getting your ass kicked by them a bit. And then I don't know, I'd just be like, if I was talking to myself, it's just like, take better notes and work on even more crazy stuff so you can expose it to the world later. <laughs> I think there's like actually a lot of value in, you know, there's this 
article about private prisons written by Shane Bauer for Mother Jones, where he went undercover for months working as a guard at a private prison. And that reporting directly led to the Obama administration deciding to no longer use private prisons at the federal level. And I think that if you go in and you collect information, you can actually end up doing good down the line in exposing that to the world. But you might be sacrificing some significant part of your soul in the process. Yes. And there are other things in the and I think I think one of the crucial things is that the prestige stuff is bullshit. Don't live a life, you know, to me, I, I tell young people, you know, find things that are meaningful to you to do with your life rather than things that are the top of some perceived hierarchy of uh, commendable professions for smart people. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that prestige, unfortunately, correlates to a bunch of other things that people find desirable, like connecting with impacting the world or like like people who are like, you know, in positions of power and getting respect or whatever. But I agree. I, I think I've like moved from something that was like very legibly a success into a career that makes no money. And I would just say like, I am so much happier now doing work that I think is actually helping the world. And uh, I was miserable when I was at McKinsey. And if you really want to do the most good, it's super unlikely that working at McKinsey is going to be the way to do that. And that you should look at careers that are directly about helping people and don't have this kind of indirect path towards uh, having a positive impact. Well, I, you know, I went to law school and a lot of my colleagues in law school went to work at elite law firms. And there's kind of all of the stuff that you've talked about is kind of similar at the elite law firms. You know, you go in and they talk about all the pro bono work they do. And also they go like, well, we'll pay you a ton of money and maybe you can work on these pro bono cases that are good. And then some of the time you'll be working for monsters, but uh, even monsters deserve someone to help them. But I, I just couldn't help but feel when I saw what my colleagues had to do all day. My God, how unsatisfying and miserable <laughs> that seems. And yeah. now I edit the magazine. I had to think creatively about what I could do. And it wasn't easy and it doesn't pay well. It, it pays horribly, in fact. But <laughs> I have to say, just what a great life I live compared to a lot of the people I went to law school with. And when I see every... Uh, month the law school official magazine comes in the mail and it is the obituaries page and there'll be things like so and so graduated from Yale law school in 1950 then he worked to went to work for the firm of so and so so and so and so and so and then he died last year and it's like 50 years and all he did was just you know work for this awful law firm and you're like what a Come on, is that what you... So think about, what do you yeah. want to be printed in the alumni obituary? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. No, I, I really do think some people would see it as like a sacrifice or I could be making more money if I was still working in the corporate sector or something. But like, I don't know, if you're actually trying to be happy and you give a shit about the world, just working on making it less fucked up is a, a better way to be yeah. happy than doing anything else. Strongly recommend giving a shit about the world. <laughs> I, I didn't really have much of a choice. <laughs> so, Garrison Lovely, the cover story for the nation that you have written, people should read. They should also go back to your current affairs piece on McKinsey, where you call them Capitalist Willing Executioners. And they should also go to garrisonlovely.substack.com where you're starting up a substack. They can find you at garrisonlovely.com as well. Garrison Lovely, thank you so much for joining us on Current Affairs today. Thank you, Nathan. It's been fun. The Current Affairs Podcast is a product of Current Affairs Magazine. If you are not subscribed to Current Affairs Magazine, visit currentaffairs.org slash subscribe today and get our glorious print edition. The Current Affairs Podcast is released regularly every week on patreon.com slash current affairs. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.